Alright, so the next uh, presentation in this third module is going to talk about some improvements to spanning tree. Um, we discussed a 50 second convergent time in the previous uh, presentation. Obviously this is a lot uh, higher than we would expect in modern networks, and so we'll talk about some different ways that spanning tree deals with that today. So here are some of the problems that we've encountered uh, just looking at spanning tree really quickly. Um, obviously spanning tree takes a long time to converge. Ports have to go through listening and learning states even if there aren't any switches connected to that interface. Just in case, for whatever reason, a new switch is connected and BP the user received, or for example, uh, a different link comes up or a redundant link has failed somewhere else in the network and uh, something has become unblocked. And so ports will always have to go through those listening and learning states, even if there aren't necessarily any switches, switches connected. The spanning tree takes a very conservative, conservative approach to preventing loops in the network, and so it will always place those ports into those states. Um, a rogue switch could possibly become root on the network. This is an interesting attack. Um, it hasn't been implemented too much. I haven't seen a whole lot of it. But uh, for example, let's say I, a malicious attacker, set a very, very low priority value on a switch and connected it to your existing spanning tree topology. Now, assuming you don't have any sort of protection on, my switch will become the root. That is, my switch will become the center of your switching universe, and all traffic that is destined between uh, between different switches will attempt to get forwarded through that switch, and that switch, like I said, will become the center. So, very, very bad situation there. You don't want people messing with your spanning tree topology. It can cause all sorts of performance issues, not to mention all the security issues. Uh, and now we also have to worry about VLANs here. We've discussed this so far uh, over a single broadcast domain, so we want to talk about what happens when we have multiple broadcast domains on a single switch or between several switches. The first feature that we're going to discuss uh, with respect to spanning tree is a feature known as port fast, and this is a very popular feature because it basically removes a port from spanning tree. So this is used for ports that are connected to layer 3 plus equipment, that is to say ports that are connected to routers, ports that are connected to end-user PCs or servers, or you know possibly, depending on the situation, maybe even the wireless access point. I don't recommend necessarily configuring port fast on a port like that, but it's a possible scenario. Um, the idea is that listening and learning states for ports that are configured with port fast are bypassed. And the ports that are placed, uh, the ports that are placed in port fast are automatically brought up as soon as the port is physically up. Uh, basically, if we know that a port is not going to be connected to a switch, we shouldn't have to listen for BPDUs and learn the MAC address. We should just be able to bring a port up immediately, and it shouldn't have to participate in the spanning tree. And that's effectively what port fast does. This should never be used for ports that could possibly be connected to other switches or hubs, as we risk, you know possibly connecting another switch there, causing a network loop, spanning tree becomes completely meaningless in your topology now. Another thing we need to look at for spanning tree are some security features, and there are two main ones we need to talk about today. The first one is called BPDU Guard. Um, what BPDU Guard does is it basically disables an interface if any BPDUs are seen. This is very, very nice if you want to prevent somebody from connecting switches to your network. Um, and it prevents basically any sw other switches from becoming grit or from creating network loops if they're participating in spanning tree. Obviously, if they really wanted to, somebody could connect up a non-administered switch, a switch that's not running spanning tree, and still do things, uh, but if they, for whatever reason, accidentally looped it back, the switch would see its own BPDU and would disable the port. Um, sh this should only be this should not be used for ports that you know are going to be connected to switches or hubs running spanning tree. Um, so you should only, you can, should configure this when you want to make sure that your user aren't connecting their own equipment and you know might screw something up. The second feature that we're going to talk about with respect to spanning tree security is called root guard. Um, basically, what root guard does is it allows BPDUs, but if a superior BPDU is seen, that is, a, if another switch wants to become root, the interface will be disabled. And once the superior BPDU is gone, the interface will be brought back up. So basically, this is a way to allow a user to connect more switches and to um, allow you to connect switches to this network, but it prevents uh, any switches connected from becoming root. So the next feature we're going to talk about isn't necessarily spanning tree specific. The whole point of this next feature, Ether Channel, is to perform what's called link aggregation. And the idea behind link aggregation is to bond multiple physical connections into a single layer 2 link. So again, this has less to do with spanning tree and more to do with redundancy. The whole point of spanning tree is to allow redundancy in your topology, and Ether Channel does this without even creating a loop. 
So because we're both bundling multiple layer 1 connections into a single layer 2 connections, we don't have to worry about layer 2 loops. Uh, be, even though it may be multiple cables, there's only one layer 2 connection, and so there's no loops in the topology. Um, this is known by a number of different names. This is known as the link aggregation, or possibly uh, NIC bundling, or NIC bonding, or NIC teaming, or, you know, there's lots of different uh, terms for these, so you should be familiar with these terms. This also allows for a certain amount of load balancing between the links and increased throughput if that load balancing uh, is configured correctly. Now I'm going to use load balancing with some air quotes here because strictly speaking uh, Ether Channel does not perform per frame load balancing. It doesn't put one frame on one link and one frame on another. I believe by default the frames are balanced between links based on the source MAC address. Um, and you can configure this based on the source or destination or a combination of the source and destination MAC addresses. And there are a number of, of other uh, balancing algorithms that can be used for either channel. But ultimately it is not a pure load balancing. The next feature, or I should probably say enhancement of spanning tree that we're going to discuss is rapid spanning tree protocol, or RSTP. The idea behind RSTP, um, primarily there are a few differences from it, between it and spanning tree protocol, but it does reduce the max age timer to only three times the hello timer instead of the typical six, or pardon me, ten times the hello timer. Um, that would end up being six seconds with the default hello timer. The listening state is completely eliminated now, and we only have a, a smaller learning state. Um, and so instead of one 15 second or 30 seconds spent 15 in listening, 15 in learning, we're going to shorten that learning state and completely eliminate the listening state altogether on certain ports. Um, so this is designed to improve convergence in networks without hubs. Since most Ethernet networks don't use hubs, obviously this is a you know optimal design choice as long as you're not planning on having any hubs in your network. Um, another thing, interesting thing about spanning tree is that it's able to respond proactively to topology changes. So, for example, if a link fails, spanning tree can immediately begin the convergence process and immediately fail over without having to wait for timers to expire. This typically reduces the uh, convergence time to less than a second, um, and ideally uh, the lo longest time for convergence would be six seconds. So now we're going to talk about the port rules in Rapid Spanning Tree, and these are basically similar um, to Spanning Tree, so we still see root port and designated port. We also see a port title called alternate port. Um, this is selected on a switch um, as the basically second best lowest cost to root um, in terms of a port. And this is nice if the root port link fails. Um, if it sees that the link has gone down, it doesn't even have to wait for the timer to expire. It can immediately fail over to the alternate port. Um, we also will have a backup port, which is used on a particular LAN segment if the designated port goes down. And so if you have several bridges or switches on a single LAN segment, the backup port can be selected um, if the primary designated port goes down. We also have disabled port, which is basically the equivalent to a blocked port in regular spanning tree. Um, and this basically works the same way. So uh, rapid spanning tree. Um, has some different link states that we used to describe it. We have the scarting, which is uh, basically what the interface is shut down or blocking. We have a learning state. Again, we've eliminated the listening state entirely. So this is used when the interface is transitioning from a discarding to a forwarding state. And then we have the forwarding state, which is where it's forwarding traffic just fine. We also have several different specific link types for rapid spanning tree. Um, and so these link types that we're going to talk about are edge type. Uh, this is basically uh, a link that is configured with port fast. It is a link that's not connected to another bridge. And obviously these edge type connections don't have to participate in the spanning tree, and so they're eliminated. There's another link type called link type point to point. Uh, point to point is nice in most modern topologies because y you don't have to worry about the possibility of any more than two bridges sharing the same link. Point to point offers uh, some higher negotiation settings and it provides for active negotiation in the case of a link failure. Finally, you have link type shared, which is basically uh, shared possibly by more than one uh, bridge or switch. And this is basically your typical spanning tree scenario where you may have more than one bridge on a link, and so all of those bridges have to participate in the spanning tree. So that will that will display as link type shared. Um, these link type distinctions allow for a bit faster convergence. As I mentioned, edge type connections are always set to designated ports. They don't really have to be. Uh, they don't really have to participate in the spanning tree. Um, but point to point connections don't need to worry about any other switches on the same collision domain, um, and so they can actually active negotiate with each. Uh, actively negotiate with each other without having to worry about uh, any other bridges getting in the way. Rapid spanning tree convergence. Um, basically, edge type connections are handled as a port bus for configured. In fact, the edge type and port fast amount to the same thing. Link type connections are handled in the same way that sandal tree, spanning tree handles a normal link failure, but with the reduced timers. 
link type points and white connections are actually, like I mentioned, actively negotiated back and forth. So the switches will talk to each other and determine uh, that a spanning tree uh, topology has changed or a topology change has occurred, and it will try to negotiate a better designated port and report, and so on. Um, there is a good example of rapid spanning tree convergence in the text that I want you to go over um, if that's possible. And it'll provide you with a very, very good idea of how rapid spanning tree works and what this auto negotiation is that I'm talking about. Um, finally, we have to worry about this problem uh, with multiple broadcast domains and possibly broadcast domains spanning multiple switches. Um, and so we have what's called per VLAN spanning tree. Um, so Cisco uh, proprietary version of this is per VLAN spanning tree plus. Um, basically, the lowest 12 bits of the priority are used for the VLAN ID, and then there's one instance used for each VLAN. And the idea here is that you basically have spanning tree running on each VLAN on each switch. And so if you have a switch, single switch with three VLANs, it's going to be running three instances of spanning tree and effectively acting like three different switches. Um, there's also a rapid spanning tree version of per VLAN spanning tree that is per VLAN rapid spanning tree, which you can configure as well. Um, there's also another uh, version, uh, per, uh, basically per VLAN spanning tree, it's not really per VLAN spanning tree. Um, it's called multiple instances of spanning trees, and it's not uh, something that we'll be covering for the CCNA, but uh, needless to say, multiple instances of spanning tree does not require one instance per each VLAN. It actually manages spanning tree on all of the different VLANs. And that's just about going to wrap it up for spanning trees. So again, I'm going to encourage you to go back to the text, look at the different examples, and try to understand spanning tree as best as you can. You're going to need to be able to um, detect uh, what the root switch is in a given topology. You're going to need to be able to detect loops in a topology, determine uh, what, whether a port will be in a designated or blocking state, stuff like that. So have a look at the uh, materials. Again, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to comment on the video or, you know, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I look forward to talking to you in the next presentation.